Hello and uh, thank you for linking in. My name's uh, Lachlan Jolly. I'm from the University of Adelaide and the Robinson Research Institute uh, from South Australia. And today I wanted to discuss the way that we've been using uh, stem cell models to assess the genetic causes and genetic chains that are associated with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, I guess for our lab, we, um, we begin by trying to identify and the genetic causes of these disorders, such as epilepsy, intellectual disability, and, and more recently cerebral palsy, um, by doing genetic screens. And of course, um, identifying the genes involved is, is really helpful information to relay back to the family. But often the genes that we find may be novel, they may be rare, and their actual um, you know, their involvement in the disorder may not be as clear cut. Um, so when the genetics uh, are perhaps lacking, we, we turn to more functional assays to try and really assess the effects of these new changes to, to work out whether the, the genes are actually uh, involved with brain development and, and whether the variants are actually pathogenic. Of course, by studying um, the function of these genes in model systems that recapitulate brain development, that gives us also some sort of indication on the role of, of, of perhaps pathological mechanisms. And I guess through this, it gives us avenues towards um, developing uh, therapies at the same time. So today I'll, I'll talk about how we're using stem cells um, uh, as a model system to, to really assess the effects of genetic change. Um, and, and I guess this comes from um, just looking at the resources we have available. Um, the stem cells are, are really helpful. I mean, patient-derived cell lines are a great source of, an endless source of, of DNA, whether they be fibroblasts or, or blood cell lines that help us um, with gene discovery. But they're, they're very poor at modeling uh, developmental process going on in the, in, in the brain. Um, for this, of course, we can use small animal models, and, and these are really excellent for, for modeling development. And, and also, you can, can get a handle on um, some cell and molecular biology as well. But it's quite an investment uh, to go and make a mouse for every novel gene or novel variant that you discover that you want to um, that you want to interrogate. Um, cell culture models, on the other hand, are, are very accessible, easy to manipulate, but they, um, for the large part, don't really model the developmental processes all that well. Um, so what we find is that sort of like a, a compromise, I guess, by using cells extracted from the developing mouse brain and culture these. Um, ex vivo and use these as our model. Um, the benefit here is that when you extract a cell from the developing mouse embryo, it sort of maintains some of its developmental potential. So for example, if you, if you take a stem cell from a mouse, it, it still um, will produce the cell types um, which intrinsically could do uh, in vivo. And that gives you an ability to monitor things like self renewal um, uh, and, and differentiation processes. And of course, um, I'd like to say that there's also now quite nice ex vivo models from human patients that have been induced pluripotent stem cells, which offer a, a similar uh, sort of avenue. But today, I really wanted to focus on um, our studies with, with mouse. So depending on where you derive um, the cells from, it gives you an opportunity to, or, or a window to look into different uh, developmental processes. Um, we can use embryonic stem cells, which are derived from the inner cell mass, to really model some of the earlier stages of, of embryonic development. Uh, for example, for us, we're really interested in differentiating these into neurons, and quite nicely, you can model the processes of, of neural induction, neural tube formation, um, neural progenitor cell biology, and neurogenesis. But in other instances, our genes um, may be expressed in particular regions of the brain, or we may be more interested in, in actually identifying cells which are more relevant to the, to the structure of the brain which may be affected in the patients. And for us, this is commonly the hippocampus and, and the cortex because um, this is where a lot of the learning and memory problems associated with intellectual disability uh, are stem from. So in these instances, we can, we can isolate neural progenitor cells from the developing cortex, for example, and again, study their self-renewal and their differentiation potential. In other instances, we may be really um, trying to interrogate the role of a gene in neurons, uh, whether it be the way that neurons connect with one another, uh, form networks, or, or communicate with one another. And in this instance, we really like a pure populations of neurons uh, 
um, to study and we can do this by, for example, isolating neurons from the developing hippocampus and that gives you a nice homogeneous population of, of cells to study. Um, and I guess what I wanted to do today is, is basically, well, I, sh I should mention the, the benefit of using all of these in vitro systems is, as I mentioned before, that they're highly accessible and highly amenable to, to manipulation. So you can quite easily overexpress or knock down genes of interest um, or add in, for example, small molecule inhibitors to do, um, to, to really model these, um, the effects of uh, genetic change involved with, in, uh, with these neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, to highlight the use of all three of these systems I have up on the, on the diagram here today, I wanted to discuss our studies on a gene um, called USP9X. Now we first came uh, interested in this gene um, in 2009 when a, when a publication came out that identified variants in this gene um, in three separate families that were uh, coming from individuals with intellectual disability. Now at this point in time there was really little known about this gene in its role in brain development. Um, and so we weren't sure whether this is, was, whether this is the right gene um, and whether the variants in this gene were actually pathogenic or not. Um, and so to really help diagnosis and help us understand uh, the possibility that this was an intellectual disability gene, we turned to our um, um, to, a, to, to more functional studies. Now we really want to know whether this gene does regulate brain development, um, and of course whether the variants alter function. So if we look through the literature first, we, we discovered that this gene, USP9X, is a substrate-specific deubiquitolating enzyme. And what that means is uh, that it essentially reverses the effects of ubiquitolation. So proteins can be monoubiquitolated, and that can affect their localization, activity, um, and function. Um, or as probably all know, uh, gene, uh, proteins can be polyubiquitolated, and this is a, a signal that flags that protein for proteasomal degradation. Now, a deubiquitolating enzyme essentially reverses this process, so um, can reverse, for example, rescue proteins from degradation. And USP9X does so in a substrate-specific manner. Um, and just listed below here are some of the substrates that we know of USP9X, and you can see some of them are involved in cell polarity, um, some of them are involved in key developmental signaling pathways, and some of them are involved in uh, uh, proteins that are involved with uh, central nervous system disorders. So certainly um, uh, an interesting gene to study. Um, what was also known was that this gene was uh, identified as being a stemness gene. Um, and what I mean by that was it was a term used to describe genes that were highly expressed in stem cell populations uh, when compared against their uh, direct differentiated derivatives. And USP9X is one of these uh, 37 genes identified in this study here that identify genes highly expressed in hemopoietic, embryonic, and neural stem cell populations, and also two skin cell populations. Um, and this has been shown in, in, in mouse stem cell populations, but also in human stem cell populations, also at the level of transcriptome and proteomic studies. Um, so it's certainly involved with, with, in, in some aspects well, suggested it was involved in some aspects of, of stem cell biology. Um, for us, we're also intrigued by the evidence that, at least in the developing brain, that uh, USP9X was highly expressed by in situ hybridization in the progenitor cells of the developing brain. So for us, one of the first things we did was really have a look at the protein localization of USP9X in the developing brain, and this is a cross-section through the cortex. Um, and what we found was USP9X was really highly enriched at right at the ventricular surface um, or the apical side of the, of the progenitor cells. Um, this domain is shared by the cell adhesion proteins, NK adherin. Um, and what this, uh, this, this was quite interesting to us because it, it's this region of, of the developing brain where stem cells divide and really make their decision of whether to self-renew or differentiate. Um, and what this suggests is that this region, this, this ventricular surface of the brain, is enriched in, in cell fate determinants. And that USP9X was really expressed here, gave us some sort of clue that perhaps USP9X might be regulating uh, the cell fate um, of neural progenitor cells. To 
initially assay whether USP and X had a role in these cells, we turned to um, mouse embryonic stem cell differentiation. So we created transgenic uh, mouse embryonic stem cells that harbored a transgene um, that overexpressed USP on X specifically in neural progenitor cells um, by virtue of having a, a nesting specific promoter. And what we're seeing uh, in, the, in the images below is what the cultures look, at, look like at the ends of differentiation. And we can quite clearly see uh, even by phase contrast, that the, the overexpression of USP on X really changed the architecture of the way that these cultures uh, looked. Through uh, marker gene analysis, we found that there was excessive amounts of neuroprogenitor cells in these cultures at earlier time points. And not only were there more progenitors, they were arranged differently. And what we can see in control cultures is that the progenitor cells in red and the neurons in blue were sort of arranged in a lattice-like structure and the cell adhesion uh, complexes and cadhered again in green was sort of randomly distributed whereas when we overexpressed USP on X the cultures really became highly polarized so um, you can see a kind of like a neural tube like structure here where the cells adhering to each other through a central sort of um, ring of adhesion the progenitor cells radiate out um, sort of outwards and the, and then the neurons in blue were sort of populated in the um, in sort of like basal locations. And we can quantitate, um, the, I guess, the, the number of polarized um, colonies in these cultures to show that really USP on X um, really did promote the polarity of neural progenitor cells. And it was this polarity um, that sort of acted upstream to promote the self-renewal and hence the, um, the increase in neural progenitor cells that we saw. So we can look at self-renewal in, in a couple of different ways in these cultures. One is to, to really look at, I guess, the ratio of uh, neuronal cells to progenitor cells um, using um, cell counts and these um, markers. And for example, in control cultures, for every neuron, we had around about three progenitor cells present. But this uh, ratio was doubled when we looked at cultures overexpressing USP on X. And we showed this another way, um, that, I mean, that suggested self-renewal, but we also showed this another way using the gold standard uh, BRDE pulse chase assay. So we add BRDE to the cultures, which labels cells undergoing S phase, i.e. Um, proliferative or progenitor cells. And immediately following this labeling, we can see around 50% of cells um, in both controls and, and, and USP on X cultures were labeled. But if we have a look at which cells retained the label 24 hours later, we can see that around about only 50% of the progenitor cells now contain this marker, whereas um, in the uh, USP9X cultures, um, this was much, much higher, suggesting that the cells overexpressing USP9X were much likely to divide and give rise to more progenitor cells as opposed to differentiated cells. So certainly here, USP on X promoted the self-renewal and the polarity of neural progenitor cells. Based on this evidence, uh, we were encouraged to go and uh, invest in making a, a knockout mouse. And this was important for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, we, we also um, uh, hypothesized that the variants in USP on X that were causing, uh, that we found in the patients were, were likely loss of function. And so loss of function model was, was perhaps a, a much better choice to look at. And when we made these uh, knockout mice and looked at their, looked at their developing brains, we saw um, uh, quite a large architectural difference in the cortex. And when we looked at this more molecularly, we could, saw, we could see evidence of altered uh, polarity. We could see evidence of altered neural progenitor cell behavior. Um, and I guess we can probably see this just looking at the size of the hippocampus, for example, you can see it's greatly reduced compared to controls. So this is likely a, a neural progenitor cell defect. We also saw evidence of altered migration um, within the hippocampus, neuronal migration. And we also saw evidence of altered uh, ax axon growth. So you can see the corpus callosum here in the control is essentially almost absent in the knockout mouse. So, uh, I should say that we're also now investigating the behavioural defects in these mice and we can see some evidence of, of altered learning and memory. So um, I guess collectively we saw evidence of altered progenitor cell behaviour, altered 
neuronal migration and altered axon growth in, in these mice. And together with our evidence on the embryonic stem cell derived neuroprogenitors, it, it certainly um, highlighted to us that indeed USP on X is a gene that uh, regulates normal brain development. But this didn't really give us a handle on whether the variants that we discovered were altering USP on X function. And so that was the next question that we wanted to address. And the approach that we took was that, well, whether um, if we were seeing these um, these defects in, in neuronal uh, in neural developmental processes in the knockout mice, we wondered whether we could um, whether these differences could also be precipitated in vitro. So if we actually isolate either neural stem cells or neurons from the knockout mice and assay their behaviour in vitro, whether we could also see these these defects. The point being that if we could identify differences between knockout and wild type um, cells in, in culture, then that would give us the ability to then try and rescue these defects by either overexpressing human wild type USP on X or um, the variants. And in, in this way, we can actually assay the function of the variants. So I guess um, I can show you some of these assays, and, and I guess this, in a way, also um, gives me a an opportunity to explain some of the some of the ways that you can um, use these stem cell assays um, to, to really um, have a look at um, the function of the cells um, of the developing brain, but actually in a dish. So what I've got here is a diagram of what's called the Neurosphere assay, where we take uh, cells from the developing uh, wild type or knockout mice, and these cells grown in vitro form um, non-adherent spheres of cells, um, balls of cells. And these uh, are so-called neurospheres. They contain, um, they're a heterogeneous population of cells that contain a rare population of stem cells, which is around about 1 to 5% of the uh, percent of cells in a neurosphere. They also contain more committed neural progenitor cells, and they can also contain, uh, I guess, differentiated cells, um, neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, for example. And the nice thing about this assay um, is that uh, once you have the cells growing in culture, that you can pathize them serially um, over many, many weeks. One of the key um, properties of the rare stem cell population is that it is able to reform spheres. So if you dissociate uh, a neurosphere and um, replate out these cells, the rare, neuros the, the rare neural stem cell population um, is able to reform spheres at very low um, density. So in a way, this gives you an opportunity to, to interrogate the function of that stem cell. One thing that you can do is um, have a look at um, the multipotency of the stem cell. So the stem cell reforms the sphere, and then you can see what sort of cells are in that sphere, and that is a direct readout of the multipotency of the original stem cell. So if you take the spheres derived from single neural stem cells and plate them out and just simply have a look at the um, types of differentiated cells that that cell can produce, you can easily assay the, um, whether the, the stem cell was a tripotent, bipotent or monopotent cell. And we can see comparing wild type cells to, to USP on X knockout cells that there was no difference in the multipotency of the stem cells present in these cultures. Another assay you can do is to look at the, the ability of that rare stem cell population to self-renew. And in this assay, essentially you plate out, um, you, you take cells from a neurosphere, dissociate them, and plate them out at very low clonal density. And then you can count the number of spheres that are derived in, in subsequent culture. And as I mentioned before, it's only the rare stem cell population that is able to reform spheres. And so at each sort of passage, the number of spheres that form is a direct readout of the number of neuros, uh, neural stem cells that were present in the previous neurosphere culture. Now, when we had a look at the neurospheres that were coming out of these cultures, what we saw, and it's quite clearly shown in this representative picture, that there were always more neurospheres in the culture, but they were also smaller in size. 
and we can, uh, I guess, quantitate this over several passages to show that indeed um, this was significant. So the fact that there are more um, neurospheres we can uh, quite easily calculate the percentage of sphere-forming cells or neural stem cells in the culture. And the absence of USP on X actually promoted the self-renewal of these rare stem cells. But of course, um, as I mentioned, the spheres are also smaller. And by calculating the number of cells in each sphere, we can see that there, indeed there was a reduced number of cells um, in the spheres. So whilst we have an, um, an, an effect on the rare stem cell population, that population certainly didn't explain why there were less cells in each sphere. Now as I mentioned, the, the nearest spheres contain the rare stem cell population, but they also, the bulk of the sphere is actually a more committed um, or transient amplifying progenitor cell population and also contains the more differentiated cells of astrocytes and neurons for example. So we wanted to see, and what you can do is have a look at which cell types are actually present in these neurospheres by quickly dissociating them um, and plating them out and immediately staining them. And then you can have a look at the types of cells that are present. Um, in this instance, we use SOX2 as a marker. This, this marker labels both the rare stem cell, but also the sort of more committed progenitor cells in the sphere. And we can also label with GFAP, which labels astrocytes, and, the, and, and neuronal marker beta 3 tubulin. And what this showed us was that in the absence of USP on X, that the, the bulk progenitor population within the sphere uh, was uh, reduced and likely um, differentiating into astrocytes and neurons. So as we showed sort of in the embryonic stem cell derived cultures, um, USP on X certainly has a role in promoting the um, sort of expansion of the sort of progenitor cells uh, in, an, in a neurosphere, whether they be ES-derived neural progenitor cells or the bulk of the progenitor cells present uh, in a neurosphere. Of course, I mentioned before that we were also interested in not only assaying uh, neural stem and neural progenitor cell behavior, but also assaying uh, neuronal migration and neuronal axon growth. And for neuronal migration, you can also use the neurosphere assay uh, quite nicely. Um, almost like a pseudo explant assay, you can take um, neurospheres, you can plate them out, and, and allow them to differentiate into neurons, which are stained at the bottom here in green, and measure their migration outward from the neurosphere. And as the picture shows here, whilst in uh, wild type cultures, the, the neurons uh, spread out quite nicely, um, this migration of neurons out of uh, USP 9X knockout neurospheres was inhibited and this was uh, clearly evident when we quantitated this. For the neuronal growth assay, um, we actually turned to isolating post-mitotic um, hippocampal neurons which grown in culture um, undergo this quite nice axonal growth which you can monitor the kinetics of and in the absence of USP 9X, um, what we saw was really stunted growth of the axons um, which was quite significant when we quantitated it. So this was really great for us because um, as we saw in vivo, we were able to identify defects in neuronal migration, neuronal growth and progenitor cell behavior in cells that were uh, cultured ex vivo from the knockout mouse. And as I mentioned before, uh, this was a really useful finding because that gave us the utility to now re-express either wild type USP on X or the variant forms to really assay whether the variant of USP on X altered the function. For this, I'll just show you our data on, and how we went through the neuronal migration and neuronal growth assays. So here we took neurospheres from the knockout wild type mice. We reintroduced GFP along with either wild type USP on X or um, the variant forms and conducted a, a slightly different migration assay. Um, but what we could see was very similar effect. Um, so here are wild type neurospheres. Um, when we overexpress USP on X, um, here we see no effect on the level of migration. Uh, when we and, it, and now we look at knockout cultures. Uh, when USP on X is knocked out, we see a decrease in migration, as I showed you before, 
And now when we re-express USP on X in these knockout cells, we're able to partially rescue this migration defect. Um, and we're also partially rescued with this leucine, the histine variant. But the, these last two variants um, were unable to really rescue this migration defect, suggesting that they had some sort of loss of function. Um, and I guess in, in the neuronal growth assay, very similar. Um, we, we took the knockout neurons. We tried to re-express either wild type or um, the variant forms of USP on X. And here again, um, we're showing that the, uh, uh, the knockout cultures had a reduction in axon growth, which we were able to rescue with overexpression of USP on X. But it's, in this instance, all three variants were unable to rescue the axon growth defect. So collectively, this told us that the, the variants um, and that we, we had identified in the patients actually did alter uh, USP on X function. And at least in the neuronal, uh, neuronal growth assay, they behave as a complete loss of function. What is also very um, useful, I mean, uh, because these variants acted as a loss of function, that, that gave us um, the opportunity to use the knockout cells as a, as a source of cells to identify the mechanisms of pathology. And again, because we're using in vitro systems, it really licenses enough, uh, licenses us to really generate as much material as we needed um, to, to do the assays and also um, do some nice sort of cell biology assays because we're able to manipulate the cells. Now here's just one example of, of one mechanism that we identified. Um, we took uh, the cells derived from the mice and cultured them uh, in vitro again. And, and in this instance, uh, we uh, transfected them with a, um, a TGF beta luciferase assay. Uh, so this is a, a TGF beta reporter assay. And when we challenged the cells with TGF beta, you can see in the wild type cultures, they, they nicely respond to TGF beta by activating the reporter. But in the knockout cells, um, this activation was absent. So USP on X was somehow inhibiting T, or the absence of USP on X was, was somehow altering or inhibiting TGF beta signaling. And in fact, we also show this using a, a more functional assay. So when you add TGF beta to, to growing neurons, they respond by increasing their axon growth. And, but this response was completely absent uh, in, the, in the knockout neurons. So this sort of suggested to us that the, the, perhaps the variants are also behaving, uh, altering TGF beta signaling. Uh, we also took a, a more non-biased approach where we look at um, um, which proteins were deregulated in the neurons. And that's because, of, as I mentioned before, USP on X is a de ubiquitinating enzyme. Um, it regulates uh, protein levels. Um, and what we identified by uh, proteomics approach was uh, 19 proteins, 18 of which were downregulated, which was consistent with loss of USP on X function. Um, and these uh, proteins were, were all involved with sort of um, uh, cytoskeletal dynamics. And in fact, if we had a look at just some of the individual proteins that were deregulated, we, we identified proteins involved in microtubule um, dynamics. And all of these proteins here uh, are known to, uh, when mutated, to give rise to cortical malformation and neurodevelopmental disorders. And we can see other proteins, uh, which we've identified, which all have roles in in things like neuronal polarity, axon growth, and neuronal cell migration, which perfectly fits with both the in vitro assays or, um, that we were, uh, or the effects of loss of USP on X in, in the in vitro and also in vivo setting. So I just wanted to finish up there. Hopefully I've showed you um, some of the benefits of using uh, these ex vivo cultures to really um, quite quickly um, identify whether novel genes that we're identifying in our genetic streams actually have a role in brain development, um, and whether the, the variants that we identified are, are actually altering uh, gene function. I guess we've done this not only for USP and X, but, but a handful of other genes in, in quite quick fashion, uh, UPS3B, TBC1D24, HCSC1, just to, name, uh, just to name a few. And I guess the benefits of using this sort of ex vivo approach is not only are we ascertaining whether the variants are pathogenic, whether the genes are involved, but we're also getting some sort of uh, idea of the pathogenic mechanisms, which aspects of brain development these, um, that these variants might be altering. Um, 
And I just wanted to uh, finish with a few uh, uh, acknowledgements. Uh, the genetics and genomic gene discovery side of the research is, is conducted and led by, uh, by Joseph Getz, who's the head of the Neurogenetics Research Program. Uh, these uh, people in white are members of my lab, and in particular Claire Homan. I'd like to thank for, for her efforts uh, on the um, validation of US Pinon experience. And also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the clinicians involved with the research, Stephen Wood, who, who provided us with the knockout mouse. And of course, the research um, uh, couldn't be done without the particip participation of the patients and the families. So uh, thanks for wiring in. Thank you very much.